if if I give my ultimate thoughts, does that mean I'm not allowed to speak anymore? <laughs> you you have uh, said it all. <laughs> Dancing fear lads. So these two first two paragraphs are deleted unless you have this book which is the based on the original edition all the other translations are based on the 1918 revised edition and these two paragraphs that we're going to talk about today are missing because they were deleted is that um tom sorry to interrupt that in edition you're holding up is that available electronically yeah it's it's on the website for free okay. There's a big picture of it on the front page of the website. And then when you look there, under that picture, it has links to it on the website. Now, the reason that Steiner deleted these first two paragraphs, entirely left out the very first introductory sentences, which seem to me today completely unessential. So what we're going to look at today, Steiner considered completely un unessential even though it's my favorite part of the whole book. I have a question, Tom, before you start, if you don't mind. Do you think he intentionally did it because at that time it was still somewhat dangerous to print something like that after the whole issue with the um, Russian anarchists? Why do you think he really didn't put it in there? I mean, because it is really relevant. So if you go back, historically to the time that he was working on the book, he was involved with uh, individualist anarchism, uh, which was a peaceful anarchism that was kind of a, a hot thing at the time. You know, Steiner liked to get involved with, you know, what's happening. And that was a hot topic. And he, and he found that these people, which were kind of like the, uh, the nonconformist artists, they're kind of on the fringe of the, uh, the liberal, free-spirited people, the kind of people that'd be prancing around a bonfire naked. And, the, and intellectually, they were, were looking for a real intellectual freedom. So it was a real uh, intellectual and action anarchism movement in a sense of being opposed to authority. And then what happened is that the communists took this anarchism philosophy and became violent. At that point, then the term anarchism became associated with terrorism. The peaceful anarchists got in big trouble because they associated them with the violent anarchists. And, and the philosophy of freedom was banned in Russia, along with his magazine articles. Russia's were the, the communist anarchists. Of course, as you see today, if somebody gets labeled a terrorist, you know, they're pretty much done, you know. Their career is over. A close friend of his who was a leader in the anarchist movement, Steiner was concerned that he was going to be going to jail, be arrested for his views, which were similar to Steiner. Steiner said that his views are the same as this guy who was, uh, you know, likely to be arrested for his views. And Steiner put out, published a letter saying how much he loved this guy's views and that they were like his views. <laughs> so it's like saying, yes, my views are the exact same as the terrorist views, you know. So it was very, uh, became very frightening. Uh, so that time, that's kind of when his magazine got shut down because of being associated with the terrorists. His magazine went out of business, readers got upset, and Steiner all of a sudden became a theosophist. So it was kind of an abrupt ending to the... Do you think part of the reason he shifted into his mad occultist phase was to kind of be safe from the backlash from something like this? I think it ended his, he, he'd also try to be, get a professor job uh, as a philosophy professor where he could continue on with his philosophy stuff and philosophy of freedom kind of things. Now he'd been labeled associated with anarchists. So I think he figured, well, there's no way I'm going to get a job at a university. Universities were very conservative back then. Uh, they're not going to, you know, today it'd be great that welcome you in with with open arms. But back then, they were, the universities were very conservative. I don't think they're going to bring an, an anarchist in. So he figured, well, I'm not getting a job. And then he, then he also wanted to run his magazine and make a living doing that, and really expressing the spirit of the philosophy of freedom in his magazine. Uh, and that got shut down because the readers re 
thought he was associated with anarchists and all were ending their subscriptions. He bought the magazine, but it had a history of being a conservative literature magazine. The subscribers who supported the magazine didn't like his, his anarchist views. They didn't like the free spirit of the philosophy of freedom views, so they started quitting the magazine, so that ran out of business. He needed a job, and uh, see, the thing about Steiner, he could go any direction. Mm-hmm. He's so brilliant. That mm-hmm. he, I mean, he was uh, lecturing the socialists at the time, and he really hated socialism. They accused, in the socialist meetings, they, they'd accuse him of, oh, there goes Steiner with one of his libertarian tirades. <laughs> so he was you know he had the philosophy of freedom views which came out came out sounding more like libertarianism and of course the socialists didn't like that they'd make fun of him i just kind of turned to steiner and i, I look at him as all pure and i never thought there was any uh, politics in his life right i never this is this, this is all a big big news flash to me but um but no it, it is interesting how um for anyone, Hahnemann, Steiner, all, you know, all of us, that yeah, we do face this, this, uh, like as we, someone said earlier tonight, um, you know, that, that is that human impulse of, of uh, striving for our individuality, but there are these counter forces of censorship or, you know, other things which we either have to fight against or choose not to speak out or whatever the case is. The philosophy of freedom. And if you look at these first two paragraphs, it's almost like uh, you can see an, an anarchist, an individualist anarchist is a f- certain kind of anarchism that was peaceful and, and resisted authority. I mean, this, this, is, this whole thing is about resisting authority and standing on individuality. It's individualist anarchism. So it puts an emphasis on individual expression, resisting conformity, authority that suppresses free expression. So that, that that's, shows you how relevant the philosophy of freedom is today, because right now we're experiencing incredible suppression of free expression, which is happening right now. I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm getting my videos censored. Everybody's getting censored on the internet. Google is censoring now its search results to make sure that it, it's only the authority approved views that appear in search and in YouTube. So it's really, uh, really terrible. I've never seen this before. So this first two paragraphs, I mean, there's no way you can miss it. This is relates to individualistic anarchism. It's all about the individual and it's a re- and that individual standing and resisting authority for the right of free expression completely. But the reason it's so anarchistic is that Steiner wanted the anarchists to connect with the book. He thought they were, mo- they were the only people he found that were moving in the direction of the philosophy of freedom. So he wanted them to connect with the book and, and feel at home in the book. Uh, so in this introduction, he's connecting to the anarchists and saying, look it, I'm with you. I'm one of you. Then then take them from that point after connecting, then then take them and, and take them further. Because of course, the philosophy of freedom goes much further and goes into all kinds of detail as far as overcoming inner authority, outer authority, everything in very great detail, especially the in, overcoming inner authority, freeing ourselves from that. I believe I am indicating correctly one of the fundamental characteristics of our age when I say that at the present day, all human interests tend to center in the cult of human individuality. An energetic effort is being made to shake off every kind of authority. See, in the first two sentences, you've got uh, everything is centered on individuality and we want to shake off every kind of authority. I mean, there's your individualistic anarchism right there in the first two sentences. Nothing is, is accepted as valid unless it springs from the roots of individuality. Everything which hinders the individual in the full de- development of his powers is thrust aside. Okay, that's kind of threatening. You know, if you're looking at it from an anarchist perspective. It says everything that hinders the individual in the full de- development of his powers is thrust aside. <laughs> You asked us if we would throw off or uh, thrust aside anything inhibiting our power of individuality. I really believe that that is an impulse in every human being, whether they are conscious of it or not. I think that that impulse lives in everyone. And it might be throughout the course of the day, certain things happen 
And it's that impulse that's playing out in the course of the day. And, and then there might be times when you start to feel inhibited or less than or concerned about what other people think. And then that impulse gets covered over. But I think it's there always. And I think that it expresses itself through us in a variety of situations. But I feel it really strongly. And I never really identified with it until we started reading this section. So I think that the fact that it's in print and written when it was written, it's almost like giving you permission to, because it's there in all of us. It's not just a few people that are feeling that they've got the chains of their culture or mores or whatever. I just feel that that is a really significant impulse in humanity generally. And it's so helpful when you start reading the book for him to start there. You're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. That's what's been in me wanting to go <laughs> my own direction, wanting to express myself in my own unique way. Well, at the end of this whole thing, he goes into how what that impulse is. It's a striving towards freedom developed to its highest pitch. So that desire for individualism is a desire for freedom, which makes a lot of sense. In fact, this whole first paragraph goes on and describes many expressions of this individualism in individual life. It's always exciting, uh, you know, when a two-year-old or, you know, says no, you know, and starts demanding what they want. I mean, it's, it's kind of ex exciting because you see the first indications of uh, the free spirit, you know, coming alive. The saying, each one of us must choose his hero in whose footsteps he toils up to Olympus no longer holds for us. I, I bet think all my general impression, you know, of, you know, of Steiner on this point of you know, individualism as opposed to following a mentor you know, whether and how to know higher worlds or whatnot is um, the point that I've gotten is that we've kind of reached an age of human development where it's possible now for the individual to wake those things up in themselves. But of course, you know, very few will fully wake that up in themselves. But, but in a, in a sense, you know, we can become free of the masters and gurus if we wake that up. That That's the sense I've gotten from, from Steiner. We allow no ideals to be forced upon us. We are convinced that in each of us, if we only probe deep enough into the very heart of our being, there dwells, dwells something noble, something worthy of development. So as we are convinced that in each of us, if only we probe deep enough into the very heart of our being, there dwells something noble, something worthy of development. We no longer believe that there is a norm of human life to which you must all strive to conform. There's an anti-conformity line. We regard the perfection of the whole as depending on the unique perfection of each single individual. That's a very profound line. That's true. Our culture focuses on the individual, but the individual superstar. Yeah. Here's, we do not we do not want to do what anyone else can do equally well. No, our contribution to the development of the world, however trifling, must be something which, by reason of the uniqueness of our nature, we alone can offer. That's kind of an in interesting thing as far as choosing your destiny. What is there that I can do? that I can do really well just because of who I am. And it's something that I can offer that other, other people really can't. And what is my special talent? I mean, everybody has one or many. It says, never have artists been less concerned about rules and norms in art than today. Each of them asserts his right to express in the creations of his art, what is unique in him. There are dramatists who write in dialect rather than conform to the standard diction which grammar demands. Look at rap music. It's a really great example of uh, rejecting, of not conforming to standard diction. You know, it's like they have, you know, they create it, their own language. Some individuals create their own language when it comes to rap music. Then the second paragraph, 
kind of wraps this all up by saying no better expression for these phenomena can be found than this, that they result from the individual striving towards freedom developed to its highest pitch. We do not want to be dependent in any respect, and where dependence must be, we tolerate it only on condition that it coincides with the vital interest of our individuality. This also indicates the kind of people that might be interested in the philosophy of freedom. When you start seeing these kind of characteristics, kind of rebels, nonconformists, they would, they, they would have a desire for freedom. Now there's a lot of places where that urge for individuality is you're advised to suppress that and raise it up into like a selflessness. And you see this in political parties, in actually in any kind of group, it's best that if we all agree on some basic thoughts and principles and talking points, because then we're stronger. If we give up our individuality and all conform to common belief, common whatever, then we become one body. And then we get, we are, we're strong and we're powerful and we can uh, do well against whoever the enemy happens to be. That we do that through selflessness, through conformity, we become a powerful group and our organization will be more successful. All your ideas and stuff come from the individual. They don't come from the group. The, the group can't produce any ideas. It's the individuals produce ideas, unique and talented individuals. Usually the group is really controlled by one or two people anyways. So if you look at a group, you can usually find who is controlling the group and who is putting out all the, the ideas that everybody's just accepting. So actually it's just submitting to a particular strong person. And in the new preface, it was kind of about the anthroposophists he was talking to. He was kind of linking them into the philosophy of freedom. So in that sense, no, I'm not trying to link in this group of people anymore. I'm trying to link in the anthroposophists into the philosophy of freedom, build a connection there. I think that's why I needed to write a new preface because it was the book now is for a different set of people than it was originally. So when you read the new preface that he wrote in 1918, it, it speaks a lot to uh, anthroposophy. I was trying to figure out what group of people would be most interested in reading the philosophy of freedom and how does one go about connecting with them? That makes the most sense to me is that at the time he first wrote it, the group that was most likely to pick up on the book were the peaceful anarchists. And then 25 years later, the other group that he was most likely to pick up on the book was the anthroposophists. So I'm just thinking today, as I go on to different internet sites, I find myself drawn to certain people that are doing the neuroscience, which I really liked your YouTube video about research uh, of the two scientists. Also, I thought it was wonderful how you put in about they're still looking at it from a materialistic point of view. They think the brain is producing the thought, not thinking producing the thought. But there are other people out there that are all, there's this whole big thing about neuroscience and meditation and all these other exercises. To, and so I had this thought, you know, I would go online, I'm going to working through the philosophy of freedom, and I could say, I cured my financial life by reading the philosophy of freedom, or I cured my insomnia by reading the philosophy of freedom. I mean, so these people that are out there with their various chronic illnesses or situations, relationship situations or their, you know, if you achieve this freedom that Rudolf Steiner is talking about, you too can have, enjoy better health, better relationships, better financial status, whatever. I don't know. You know, that's, that's the, the individual testimonial, which is a hugely persuasive for other people. If you have individual testimony that, yeah, I got something out of this, which is hugely needed with the philosophy of freedom. I mean, I've, I've made attempts before to have people, you know, write a little something about how the philosophy of freedom helped their life. And it's something that's missing that I would hope that as more people get interested, that these testimonies could come forward because nobody's interested in a philosophy book, you know. I mean, people are interested in 
something that changes their life, this book will really change your life. It's a life philosophy that has results. It's really a question of connecting up the principles that you're probably already doing and then identifying that, oh, this is a principle that led to the success. And that principle also is in the philosophy of freedom. So it's kind of really in connecting the pieces. But for myself, it really helped a lot as far as kind of putting all these different principles in, a, in, a, in an order. Then you can live more consciously. Things are more effective if you're, if you're co- consciously living. Well, I'm also interested in the act of reading the book to experience pure thought. Because I'm, even if I may not be there yet, as I'm going through and I'm reading chapter one, and I'm just reading it almost like I'm doing a meditation so that if I have some issue coming up in my personal life, I'm not necessarily even reading this for the principles or the content. I'm reading it for the experience of walking through this path, this process, and experiencing pure thinking. I'm trusting that as I read it, there are shifts occurring both at a conscious level and that insights will come. Having a a different mindset when I go to work and I interact with my colleagues, that I can draw on that noble part of myself as I'm, I'm ennobling it as I'm just reading the book. So it's the act, activity for me, it's the act of reading it that is as important for me as the content and the principles in the book. The other thought, the other question about who to present this book to or you know, who would be a keen audience for it, it you know, it's interesting. Um, Steiner started with the, um, the individual anarchists, you know, the peaceful individual anarchists. And now, now today, there's actually a very... Um, a vibrant uh, individualist anarchist movement uh, online. You know, there are podcasts and Facebook groups and a million different things. And this this idea of peaceful individual anarchy has become a very strong um, kind of anti political movement. Um, so I'm I'm just curious. I'm wondering if um, there's any way of you know, I know you're working hard, Tom, on the videos and all these things. If there's any way of presenting them in a way that's interesting to these modern anarchist groups, I, I, you know, it's it's just something I know a lot about. I, I listen to a lot of these podcasts, and you know, I, I'm very interested personally. But so personally, I'm interested in finding the connection. I just don't know if these groups would kind of gravitate to you know to a philosophical book, as someone mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. That's that's always the challenge of marketing. How, and I th- again, someone said something like this a minute ago too, is um, you presented in that, um, um, Teresa, I think you were saying that. It's like, oh yeah, the philosophy of freedom cured my insomnia or what, whatever examples you're saying. You kind of have to boil it down to hook, to hook one particular example into it and you kind of bring people's interest in, you know, through one, one particular point at a time or one particular solution at a time in that sense, you know. Just following how the thinking process goes, like I can read it, and it all sounds fine and great, but... You know, that's something we can get into as we start moving through the text now, because I know I take a very, I take approach of experiencing everything in the book. Well, really the not... idea of living thinking and dead thinking, and, you know, it's uh, still, uh, sometimes I wonder... I'm sure you have had these experiences. It's a question of learning the concepts and then kind of connecting those experiences within yourself with the concepts. Because what I've learned is that as soon as you start thinking that, oh, he's describing some you know, amazing experience that I'll maybe have in another lifetime or something, you know, then you're off track as far as the philosophy yeah, no, reading I goes. Know that. Yeah, for sure. I think pretty much everything in the book, uh, most people have experienced and it's just a, a question of uh, becoming conscious of it and connecting up with it. You might realize that you don't have to strive so much to become an ethical individualist that you already are one, but now you can become more conscious of that and become a better one. 